Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here um, in the, uh, the kind of afternoon of the third day. So your tenacity is, is impressive. Um, so I will introduce myself in just a moment. But first, I have a question for all of you. So I do admit that I'm going to be talking a little bit about Kubernetes today. And I'll tell you how that came about in just a moment. So here's my first question for you. How many folks here are working at an organization where you have a plan to do something with Kubernetes? Just about everyone. Um, how many of you know what the business value is that you're going to get out of your Kubernetes? Fewer of you. OK. So that, in fact, is exactly what I want to talk about today. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, the first thing I'll tell you about is a little bit of my background. Oh, one more question. How many folks have seen me, saw me um, present either here in London or in Vegas last year? So just a couple of you. OK. So this is a follow-on to the, the talk that I gave in 2018 at DevOps Enterprise. But I promise there's going to be some fresh stuff. So there's a little bit of a re review at the beginning, but bear with me. Um, so in terms of uh, a little bit of the overlap, let me give you a little bit of my background. I uh, am a trained computer scientist. I studied computer science in the university. I uh, did my undergraduate at a very pragmatic oriented university in the greater LA area where I learned lots of languages that were going to be used in industry. Then I worked for a few years and decided to go back to graduate school, um, started a PhD, never finished. The ABD is all but, all but dissertation. Um, and uh, I went to Indiana University, which is out in the middle of nowhere, that is very much a research-oriented school. So there I actually studied theory of computing and programming languages. And you'll see that that comes into play when I talk about things like imperative languages and functional languages. Now I work for Pivotal um, doing uh, technical product strategy. Um, I spent the first bit, the first three years or so at Pivotal, I've been there since the spinoff, uh, doing products, uh, doing a Pivotal uh, Cloud Foundry. So that's our PaaS product. I spent about a year doing cloud caching. What does it mean to actually do caching in this new cloud native way? And for the last two years, I've been working on our PKS product, which is our Kubernetes offering. So I've been working in the Kubernetes space for about two years now. And then I'm very pleased to announce that as of about a month ago, uh, my book is in print. So I finally published my book. Um, it was three years of nights, weekends, and vacations. Next week, I'm on vacation for the first time in three years, not writing a book. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and you'll see even where elements of this come through in the conversation that we're having here. So um, the, so, what I do when I say I work on product strategy is I'm a technologist, and most of my career, I've always worked in emerging tech. I'm a change junkie, so I always need to be playing with the latest, greatest, newest stuff. But emerging tech, just for propeller head stuff, is fun. But where I really get a charge out of it is when we start, start taking new emerging technology, like Kubernetes, which is this beautiful, shiny object, and we start to figure out how we're actually going to generate business value from that. And that's what I want to do in this talk today. Now, I'm going to talk about imperative versus functional. So I'm going to do a very quick summary of some stuff to start. And so very, very quickly, when I started my career, I started working on embedded systems. We had, I was working on, uh, on algorithms and on programs that operated single-threaded on a single processor. Then the industry started to get to the point where they had multi-threading. And then eventually, we had multiple cores or multiple computers. And today, we have systems that look like this. And that's what I really talk about in my book, is that cloud native is where you have highly distributed and highly, highly distributed um, programs running in an environment that's constantly changing. That's really the essence of what cloud native is. But let's look at it from a programming languages perspective. 
In the beginning, when we were doing just single process or single threaded, we could use things like assembly language. And there were times where we actually programmed an assembly to ink out the most performance that we could out of something. Then we used languages like Fortran and C and C++ and Java and, and even these days Golang. And you can see that those are getting, as the complexity of the, the architecture, the computer architecture increased, we were able to do more in our programs by using a higher level language. And now what's interesting is that when I went to Indiana University, I programmed in Scheme, a functional language. And then I went back to industry and I pretty much left functional programming behind. But these days we are seeing, and you hear Gene talking about it all the time, we're seeing industry using languages like Clojure and Scala and Kotlin and F-sharp. You heard Scott talking about F-sharp this morning. And I believe that the reason for that is that we have, um, it's because of the highly distributed nature and the fact that we're operating in an environment where lots of failures occur and we have to adapt to that. That's really led to the popularity of these languages. So these are what we would call imperative programming languages, so sequential languages, we control every step. And this is functional, which is a different style. So hallmarks of imperative programs, those earlier programs, are that, again, sequential. You are really controlling every step in the program yourself as the programmer. And you're using variables, and variables in and of themselves isn't actually the problem. It's the fact that we side effect those variables, that we have mutability. And what ends up happening is you end up with hairy edge cases. Those, out, those programs are difficult to parallelize because as soon as you have shared state, then what do you do? Now, by contrast, if we move over into the hallmarks of functional programs, they are declarative. That is, I say, what the relationships between things are, but I'm starting to cede some of the control to the programming language itself. I'm saying programming language, and I'll show you an example of this in just a moment, programming language and compiler, you go ahead and figure out what the most optimal execution on this algorithm is. There's no side effects. You heard Scott talking about no side effects earlier today. There's huge value that comes from that. And we tend to do things in a recursive way instead of in a control loop way. That results in, in programs that are easier to pal parallelize, far fewer edge cases, and provably correct. And that provably correct part is super important because it's what allows an algorithm to optimize your execution. So let me give you a very concrete example. Uh, and before I jump into the example, the real punchline of what I'm getting at here is that are, do you want to use an imperative model or do you want to use a functional model? to think through your problem. And I am asserting that in today's day and age where we have a lot more distributed systems in a very complex, constantly changing environment, that the functional model is a better model within which to solve our problems. It's a better model for us to take on that cognitive load and solve those problems. And again, you saw Scott talking about that this morning. So let me give you, uh, so again, kind of differences between imperative and functional. I've already talked about most of these, so I'll just do the build out really quickly. Um, yeah, in fact, I did talk about all of these. Um, let's get on to the example. Ah, so my favorite picture, uh, this, this uh, woman here, she's about 80 years old, she's a programmer, I think she rocks. And the whole point is that as much as she rocks, we probably don't need her to reason about every single part of that program. Let's let the computer, let's let the matrix do some of that reasoning for us, maybe the matrix. So let's move on to the example. What do I actually mean by machines doing the reasoning for us? So here is a program. What this program does is it starts with a list. You can see there it has six elements in it. And if we read the, the algorithm, you can see that the first thing that I do is I apply a filter to that list, filtering out only, filter, keeping only the things that are less than 30. So you can see I'll drop the one and the five. Then, oh, I think I have a bug in the next slide, but we'll, we'll see. Um, then I take that list and I filter that for only the things that are more than 20. Oh, I'm sorry, I went the other way around. Got rid of 40, now I'm gonna get rid of one and five. 
And so that's what ends up happening, is the first time through I get rid of 40, the second time I go through I get rid of 1 and 5. Then I look up the second element of that, I know it's probably zero-based indexing, but it actually pseudocode works better this way, and I get the value 27. Now, that is very controlled. I controlled every step. Now let's take that same program and let's think about what the computer could do to actually optimize this for me. So instead of doing it the way that I just showed you in the previous slide, what if I do this instead? And I say, let me take the first element of the list. Is it less than 30? Yep. Now I can say, well, is it also more than 20? And it is, so I now know the first element in my output array. Then I can take the next element and say, is it less than 30? Yep. Is it greater than 20? Yep. And there I get my answer. So you see the difference there? Is that this is far more performant. Now it depends on things like immutability and so on. So there's our answer, and I didn't have to process the rest of the array. Now, with these six elements, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference, but if I'm doing human genome sequencing and I'm looking for the first place that I have a, genome se a, a match in my genomes, genome, I might save myself a whole boatload of processing time. So what's the business value? Well, it might be that I can process my big data set faster, which means I can be first to market. That's business value. See how functional programming might get me closer to my business value. All right, so how does all of that relate to ops and infrastructure? What I presented last year at this forum was I said, all right, in terms of systems programming, by that I mean deployment of our applications. We know that we do that with code. The code that we've been using in the past are things like Bash and Puppet and Chef and Ansible, things that tend to be more imperative. Now, as our systems have gotten more complex, we've seen the emergence of other systems like Kubernetes, like Cloud Foundry, like another component we have within that called Bosch, which take a much more functional approach. And last year, you can go take a look at the video, I go through this in a lot more detail, and I compare some of the imperative style, which was scripted deployments to declarative deployments, SSHing into a box to immutable infrastructure, long-running contexts to ephemeral containers, middleware to things like sidecars, and you heard Gene mention those earlier today. Today, I'm gonna focus on just declarative deployments and immutable infrastructure. And I'm gonna show you some demo of the way that some of this works in Kubernetes, but then we'll tie it back to business value. Okay, so declarative deployments. I'm going to start with an example. This is an example that runs through my entire book. It's a very simple deployment. What I have is a couple of microservices. I've got the connection service and the post service. The connection service is who follows who. It's, your, it's your, the users that are registered in Twitter and who follows who. The post service is a, is a listing of blog posts. And then the connections post is an aggregator. So I can say, I am Cornelia Davis, who do I follow? I want to see all the posts from the people that I follow. It's got a couple of databases in there, it's got a token store for my logins, and it's got a MySQL for my, um, my uh, blog posts and for my users. Uh, notice that I'm not saying whether it's request response. On the left-hand side, you see request response. The other ones could be event-driven, but that's not today's talk. Now, the reality is that for cloud-native software, we, of course, need to have multiple instances of all these. So I have multiple instances of connection service, multiple instances of the post service, and multiple instances of my aggregator service. So in specific, I have seven, four, and five on each one of those. Now, I'm going to spare you the YAML, but I assure you that there is a, a de declaration of what this topology looks like that says, I want five instances of this, seven of this, and four of this. It's just a declarative thing. And I'm going to now show you what happens when I tell Kubernetes, this is the topology that I want. Now, I'm also letting you know that what I have is I have a distribution, ah, so I remember now how this, uh, this works out, is so I have my Kubernetes cluster di distributed over three availability zones failure domains. 
And so the question is, how do I distribute my workloads across this? I need to do something like this. And here's the question. Are humans the best people to be making these decisions on how we distribute those workloads? I say no. So let's take a look at what the machine can do for us. So I'm going to, I promised live demo, so we are gonna do live demo. Let me come over here to, so what we have here is my three machines. Those are my three availability zones. These little things down here are actually the services. So you can see that the one that I just clicked on is the MySQL database that I showed you. It says that right over here. I also have a, um, my token store, which is Redis, and I also have a Spring, Cloud, a Spring Cloud configuration server. So that's what these are. Let's just move those off to the side. And I'll move this other thing, which is a little Kubernetes daemon that's, that's running there as well. So you see I've got my three availability zones. And right now, my application is not deployed. So let's watch this as I go through and do my deployment. So I'm going to deploy my apps. And what that deployment is doing is it's telling Kubernetes, here are the workloads that I want to deploy. So let's watch what happens here. So you can see the workloads are all the little blue things that are popping up. Those are the containers that are getting spawned. Then these right here, these little orange dots, represent the whole. They represent all of, and they effectively are like a load balancer. They are all of the connection post services, or all of the connection services, or all of the post services. So let's take a look. This one here is posts. So to keep it kind of looking like the topology that I had up on the screen before, I'm gonna drag those around. This is the aggregator, we'll put it on the left. And this is the connections. Now what I wanna show you here is I'm gonna release these servers and let them kind of come to the middle. Actually, let me drag them around a little bit. What you can see here is that Kubernetes has done a pretty darn good job evenly distributing those workloads across. That's not something that I needed to worry about at all. And that shouldn't be my concern anymore. I shouldn't decide where I'm going to um, place those workloads. So you can see here that of the seven instances that I have, two of them are going to one server, three to another, and two to another server across failure domains. Same thing with this service and the same thing with this service down here. So that's pretty cool. Now, what I wanna do now is show you what happens if an availability zone goes down. And I'm gonna go back to the slides in a moment, but because this takes just a few minutes, I'm gonna come over here and start that process. I'm actually gonna come in here into my GCP console, into the compute engine, and I am going to kill one of these nodes. And the one that I wanna do, I, I don't wanna disrupt some of the singletons that I have in there, so I'm gonna do this very carefully. Not that one, not that one. This is the one. This is the one that I'm gonna delete. And because it's part of an instance group, I have to come over here. And I am going to delete this instance. So that's gonna take just a moment. So, I just want to make sure that my little icon is about to start spinning. I'll come back up. There it went. So there we can see that that instance is going down. So let me come back to the slides here. And so you saw the first set of that. You saw what we did in terms of the distribution. And now this is what I'm in the process of doing. Is that availability zone? One of those instances is going to go away completely. And so what's going to happen? Well, many of you raised your hands and said, you're doing something with Kubernetes. Maybe you are doing it yourself. But if for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar, what Kubernetes is going to do in a moment, and hopefully I can time it so that we can see this happening in just a moment, is that it's going to reallocate those workloads to the remaining nodes. So if I go back to that, let's take a look at our um, little dashboard and we'll watch those things happen while I explain what's going on. 
Now, what you can see here, in fact, is notice that this right here, that's the server that's going away. Now, the server hasn't gone away completely, so the workloads are still attached to that server. But you can see that Kubernetes was smart enough to recognize that it couldn't reach those instances. The server's still there, but it couldn't reach the instances because they were starting to get shut down. So you can see that those little load balancer nodes automatically updated. So I don't have to go in and change some load balancer settings somewhere. Again, that's something that we in infrastructure and ops shouldn't have to worry about anymore. Now, as soon as that server goes away, we're going to see all of those workloads, and it should happen in just about a moment. We'll start to see all of those workloads start to get reallocated back into the remaining, the remaining uh, machines as well as the load balancers. By the way, I'll tell you that this is a cool little open source project that I found called Cockpit that gives you this really neat graphics visualization of the things that are in, in, uh, running in your Kubernetes environment. So if that doesn't go in just a moment, I'm gonna go back to my slides and we'll come back to it and you'll see that everything got redistributed. I'm gonna show you another one where, where we'll see it um, interactively. Uh, but I will run out of time if I don't get going. And in fact, my timer just turned red. I still have nine minutes though. So here's the question, is that when that availability zone goes down, do humans get paged? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if the workloads are still operating just fine and recover, maybe it's enough for the administrator to come in the morning and see a notification that something went wrong overnight. It shouldn't go unheeded because there, that might be a symptom of an underlying problem, but does it mean that we need to get woken up in the middle of the night? Probably not. So let's talk about the business value then. Obviously, if our systems are resilient and our applications remain up, our customers are happy. And there's all sorts of business value attached to happy customers. But I love how we've been talking at this conference a lot about employee engagement and employee happiness. If you don't get woken up at two in the morning, you're gonna be a more engaged employee as well. Right? And we've heard this, the, uh, the research that shows that engaged employees result in a better bottom line to, to companies. All right, so the second thing that I wanted to talk about that I'm gonna tie back to business value as well is immutable infrastructure. Now, this is something that containers have made far easier and far more efficient. The idea here is that my container is what's in the little dotted line box. And because the containers are immutable, that means that anything that I do inside of them is expected to be lost. I can have local state, but only for the single execution that is coming in. So what that means is that what you saw just a moment ago, and in fact, let's just show you that in the meantime, notice that all the workloads got redistributed. What happened there is that those containers didn't get moved. What happened is that the container, the old one got thrown away, and a new one got put in its place on a different host. And I threw away another one, and it came in. And I threw away another one, and it came in. I can just quickly recreate those containers. Now, you saw that resilience case, that's one of the use cases for recreating a container or creating a new container, but there's another one. And I mentioned this in the talks last year, but I want to actually take it one step further and demo this for you. And the scenario here is one of malware. Now, many of the breaches that we hear about out there, the Equifaxes and some of the other breaches, are actually, I believe Equifax was an unpatched and known vulnerability that was unpatched, but some of the breaches that we hear out there are because malware made it into the system and went undetected for months. Now, my history is that I worked, I've been in the industry for 30 years, and I have been around in the days where keeping a system up and running for 187 days was awesome. That was like a really great thing. 
It was like the number of days since we had an incident. But you know what? If I've had my system running for 187 days, that's 187 days that that malware might have been sitting on my system gathering information. So it's becoming pretty well understood that one of the best ways to combat malware is this. So here your bad actors come in, planted malware, both inside of the container and on the hosts, and then the, the bad actor goes away because they're easy to detect relative to the actual malware. What we do, instead of holding things stable for 187 days, is I can do what I just showed you on the previous screen. I can throw out the container and get a new one. If it didn't have malware on it, well, it still doesn't have malware on it. But if it had malware on it, it's now gone. And I can do that not only at the container level, but we can actually do that at the host level as well and get rid of the malware over there. Now, at Pivotal, we call that repaving, is constantly repaving before the roads are completely trashed. They might have a few potholes. We repave that. And I'm suggesting that you repave very often, like several times per week. One of our customers at Pivotal repaves every three days. Containers never live longer than three days in their environment, and he, he's not satisfied. He wants to do it every single day. So let me just take the last few minutes to show you this in action. And so without these types of capabilities, without the ability to have an orchestration system that is automatically scheduling workloads for you, what is the mental model for humans doing this? And I just realized that I was supposed to come over here and I will come back to the demo in just a moment. I was supposed to come back here and create a new node. Oh, I need my glasses. Yes, I've been in the industry that long that I'm old enough. Uh, I need to get to my Kubernetes engine. And I'm going to go into my cluster. And I am going to edit this cluster and add a node. It takes less time to add the node than it does to take it away. So uh, let me, here we go. I want one node per availability zone. And I'm gonna save that. And as soon as I see that, okay. We are, yep, updating the cluster. So I will come back to the demo in just a moment. But let me go back to my slides and explain, talk about the business value. So even before we see the demo, we can talk about the business value of this. I think the business value is pretty clear. We have a stronger security posture, which means we keep our customer data safer. We have a stronger security posture, which means no breaches. Stronger security posture, no negative headlines. So there is no demand to you, no, no um, uh, damage to your brand, all of those things. So you see how these technical elements actually are giving us a leg up on being able to, to realize these, this business value. So I'm going to spend just a moment um, with my closing stuff, and then I will probably go over about 30 seconds. Those of you who might, were in Vegas, you maybe know that I was the person that Steven Spear was yesterday, where I was trying to finish my talk, and Gene was like, no, no more, no more. He came up on stage. What I didn't get a chance to say was this. I was a skier for 25 years. When my son was four, I wanted to be the cool mom, and I switched to snowboarding because that's what he was doing. I sprained both my wrists and my shoulder before I got it. But the, it's easy, if you're a snowboarder, it's actually pretty easy to turn on your heel. Toe turns, where you're turning on your, the front end, is really hard. And it took me a long time to get it. But I can tell you that from the moment that I got that toe turn, I can tell you exactly what run I was on, exactly what turn I was making, right around this group of trees, and after that, I could toe turn. 
And that's what it means to move from imperative thinking to functional thinking. It takes that kind of a, it takes that work, it takes spraining your wrists and your shoulder. But then once you get it, it is super fun and super valuable. All right, so let me go ahead and give you this last demo, and I promise it is very, very quick. We should have our cluster backup stable, it is. And so here we go. Notice here that I have a new machine, but there's no workloads assi assigned to it. So I thought the best thing that I could do here is I could show you a repave. So let me come over here into, oh, let me go back there. I'm gonna move this over so that we can see this happening because it's gonna happen pretty quickly. So I'm gonna do a repave. And I'll show you the script for that in just a second. The repave is simply going through the process of taking one container at a time and saying, delete this container, delete this container, delete this container, delete this container. And my question is, is it doing what I, I it's not doing what I expected it to do. Notice that none of the containers are going to the new server. So maybe my server's not quite up yet, so the demo quads are not smiling on me today. Um, when I demoed this, when I practiced this earlier, what is supposed to happen is that those instances, as I was going through the repaving, are gonna get redistributed across this node. But nevertheless, you can see the repave that's happening here. Is I'm deleting an instance, recreating it, and for some reason it's not getting assigned to the new server. So I'm not sure what went wrong there. But you can see the process that's going on there, and you can see that they're getting tied back into the load balancer. And so whatever malware was on here before is no longer. So that wraps up my talk. And again, it's really about tying the technology back to business value. That's really where things change for our organizations. And um, I, again, would suggest that functional languages allow us a new mental model within which to, to process these things. So I thank you for your attention, and I will stick around here, and I think there's a talk after this, so I'll be happy to step outside as well. If any of you have questions, I would love to chat with you. Thank you so much.